Hi, it's Simon here. A couple of years ago, we broadcast this conversation between Justine Toe and David Smith, the author of a book called Learning from the Stranger. To this day, it challenges me to be intentional about living alongside people from other cultures and doing it well. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, this is Justine Toe, and you're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. How are we to live among people who are very different to ourselves? Well, we've grappled with the question of multiculturalism on the program recently, but it's great to get the thoughts of David Smith. He's a professor of education at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Professor Smith is interested in the ways that our beliefs and our values shape the way that we teach and learn. And he's also applied this approach to the ways in which we live and encounter people from different cultures to our own. And he believes that Christian faith has a lot to offer on this point. And I asked him about this on his recent visit to Sydney. I began by asking him how it's possible for people in multicultural societies to pursue a common life together where we can't assume that all agree on what that looks like. Well, even posing that as a problem that way um, seems to carry the assumption that what's going to achieve commonality is unanimity, right? That that we can have a common life together if we all agree with each other. Uh, I mean, that was pretty much the modern world's attempt to, I mean, this enlightenment notion of truth as something that everybody holds in common. If you can reproduce the same rational structures in everybody's head, then eventually you'll get peace and enlightenment and and, and so on. Um, It seems to me a Christian way of running at that is actually to say that difference is not necessarily a bad thing and love is the strategy for dealing with it, right? That... uh, that the basic call is not to be other people, it's to love other people. And um, for me, the starting point of this in a Christian context is, is actually Leviticus, which I know everybody reads regularly. Um, but uh, Leviticus 19, 18 says, love your neighbor as yourself, which is where Jesus got it from. And a few verses later, it says, love the foreigner as yourself. And uh, those are the two places in the Bible where it says, love someone as yourself. Um, it says, love your neighbor as yourself, which we're very familiar with as a, as a basic Christian ethic for dealing with other people. A few verses later, it says, love the foreigner as yourself, the person who's different from you, who didn't grow up in your community, who doesn't share your assumptions, your, your ways of moving through the world. So, so, yeah, I mean, the first thing I do is sort of question whether unanimity is actually the basis for, for common life it's, it's, or whether it's virtue. Not everyone agrees or signs up to the Christian understanding of life. There are these liberal values of uh, diversity and equality and tolerance. You know, haven't we got our bases covered? What, what does love add to that? For me, one of the biggest differences between love and tolerance is that um, love involves more positive intentionality. So um, tolerance is a willingness to let someone be, but not a willingness to go out of my way on their behalf. Whereas love is a commitment to someone else's well-being, um, which... Uh, is, is not the same as willing as saying I'm willing for them to exist and I'm not going to attack them, right? I mean, that's a good starting point. That's, you know, tolerance is not a bad thing. Um, but it's going a step beyond that and saying um, the other's well-being is important to me and when that well-being is threatened, I'm willing to step out of my way uh, and seek to secure their well-being, right? It's, it's a form of intentional attentiveness, um, not just a form of, of being willing to ignore. What does that look like, that intentionality? I think it's going to look like a lot of different things in different contexts. I mean, it's a it's, uh, great thing about this is, you, you know, you can't legislate it as a, as a set of rules because there's going to be so many different situations in which we interact. Um, I'm a language educator, so one of the things I ask my students is I say, you know, the, the golden rule is do to others as you'd have them do to you. What does the evidence suggest most English speakers would like everybody else to do for them? Uh, we want other people to learn our language. We want people to understand our politics. We want people to interpret our actions um, charitably. Uh, we want people to serve us nice food. We want people to not attack us when we travel um, and so on, right? So, so if those are all things I would like for myself, then what would it actually mean to do for others as I would want them to do to me? Um, well, it might, for a start, mean that in some cases I start learning their language because... Um, that's actually a way of sending the message that uh, I'm, I'm not just expecting all the rest of the world to do the work so that they can talk to me the way that's easy for me, but I'm actually going to try to learn to talk to other people the way that's easy for them and to listen to what they have to say. Um, it's probably going to mean going out of my way to actually find some interactions with people that are not from my own cultural background and being willing to listen and learn um, and find out what their needs, struggles, hopes, resentments are. Um, it's going to be building some relationships across across those kinds of contexts and that, that then provides a potential context for non-condescending acts of service. Um, but what that looks like specifically is going to depend where I live and who my neighbours are and, and you know, what problem I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with. So. It's a very lofty ambition yeah. at the same time. And I think sometimes when we try and encounter the other, whether they're the religious other or the ethnic other or the cultural other, 
it's very hard not to just reconfirm our own prejudices mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. So how was it possible to genuinely encounter them as them and not as some casting of them as I want them to be? In a way, it boils down to time and listening. Um, I, mean, I mean, this is why the brief reaching out encounter is not going is, is to do it. It's, it's going to take repeated sessions of letting someone tell their story and asking questions and trying to hear what's in their story and, and, and what's motivating it. Um, and there's no guarantees, right? I can always, I can always remain sealed in my worldview if, if nothing occurs to challenge that. But, but what we know about cognitive change is that um, it's pretty unlikely to happen unless something happens to make me aware of my own assumptions. And unless I find some reason to be dissatisfied with those assumptions, I find that they don't work in some way. And unless I find some bigger context in which I can reframe my assumptions. So unless I actually get into a conversation with someone and listen to them for long enough that some of my own assumptions start not working anymore, then my frame of reference is probably not going to change very much. But isn't that very idea of having, um, allowing your assumptions to be challenged, that's quite threatening as well. It is threatening, but if part of what I'm giving up is my self-deception, uh, then that's not a huge sacrifice at the end of the day. Um, I've been a Christian for 25 plus years now, and, and so I've been in the church a long time, and I'm very familiar with the passage in John 4 where Jesus comes to a well and he meets a Samaritan woman and he asks her for a drink, and she says, why do you ask me for a drink? Jews don't talk to Samaritans. And um, they start talking about living water, and then suddenly out of the blue, Jesus says, go call your husband. And she says, don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you've had five husbands, the one you're with now you're not married to. She changes the subject then and starts talking about which temple you should worship in. And then Jesus talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now, for years and years and years, I had a way of reading that passage that I'd heard in sermons, that I'd read in Bible commentaries and so on, which was uh, that uh, this is a sinful woman. She's sexually promiscuous. She's had too many guys. Um, Jesus needs her to repent. So when she starts talking about living water, he convicts her of her sin by telling her she needs to, you know, you've got five husbands and she needs to, she doesn't really want to repent. So she starts talking theology instead uh, and uh, talks about temples. Until a year ago, I came across a book by a young American woman who spent time living in Afghanistan um, with Afghani women and uh, talks about how they read that story. And out of their cultural context, it was immediately clear to them that if you're female, you don't get to choose who you marry. And so the fact that she'd had five husbands and the current one wasn't married to her meant that she'd been serially abused, essentially, that uh, she'd been handed around. Um, and that she was now so deeply shamed that she's out at the well on her own and can't go worship in the temple uh, because she's outcast from her society. And Jesus tells her that she can worship God where she is in spirit and in truth. And suddenly this is a whole different story. And suddenly I realized that for 20 years I've been reading this story out of my own cultural assumption that people in this story all get to choose their own futures because that's how I experienced my life as an educated white Western male. And suddenly a woman from Afghanistan has given me a whole different take on this story and maybe realize that actually maybe for 20 years I've been judging the woman in this story in the same way that the people in her town were and, uh, and maybe I should stop doing that. And it's a very vivid example, isn't it, of, of learning from the stranger, right. which is what you're heartily on board with. Definitely. I mean, to me, it's a, it's a beautiful thing that, you know, a British guy with a PhD who teaches at a university in America can learn how to read this passage from a, an illiterate or semi-literate woman in Afghanistan, right? Well, none, tumbling. None of, <laughs> yeah, that none of us have this kind of, um, that none of our power positions give us a corner on hearing the truth. Uh, yeah. In fact, if anything, they can make it harder for us. And uh, that there's always the possibility of receiving gifts from others, not just threats. If you've just joined us, you're listening to Life and Faith. We're bringing you an interview on how we live among those who are different from us. Our guest is David Smith, a professor of education at Calvin College. There's a risk that this tips over into naivety. You know, that there, there are bad things in the world. Cultures are not benign. Um, there, there are things in all cultures that need to be resisted. But again, that doesn't give me license to approach the world as if my culture is basically has most things right and the other culture is mostly threat and darkness. Uh, because it's always going to be more complicated than that. There are always going to be things in my own cultural formation that I need to be unlearning, and there are always going to be things in other cultural contexts that, if I'm willing to listen, I could be helpfully challenged by. People do tend to talk about Christians and the, and the history of colonialism and right. how there's this assumption of cultural superiority. We have the word of God. We right. need to convict you of it and right. convert you to our ways of life. That's all part of that history as well. Right. It's having learnt from past experience, perhaps. Right. It is, yeah. I mean, there's the, the, that's kind of a complex picture. We're certainly in full reaction against as a, against colonialism in, in some ways, and and you know there are lots of quaint stories of uh, sort of going back a couple of hundred years. Of I was reading the other day about uh, 
one of the first D Dutch missionaries to Indonesia, and one of the reasons he went to Indonesia was that he was terribly worried because there was a verse in the Bible that mentioned the four seasons, and he'd heard that there were only two seasons in Indonesia, and this must mean that the Bible wasn't true, so he had to go to see for himself, right? So um, we've, we've got this very strong narrative of the, you know, the wicked colonial missionary who went in and, and uh, you know, rapaciously overcame the, the other culture. There's, some recent work on, on the history and sociology of that has been suggesting it's not quite that simple, that you know, yes, there were examples of that, but uh, missions have also had a variety of positive social effects on the, uh, on the places that they, that they went to uh, when, you, when you track it historically in terms of social development uh, of, of those societies. So, um, so it's probably a more complicated picture than the stereotype of the evil colonial missionary, but there's certainly things there that we've tried to learn from in terms of um, Thinking of mission as something where you, if you're going to another culture, if you're interacting with another culture, you need to spend time learning, becoming involved, um, learning to listen, uh, and not just coming to stamp your identity on the, uh, on the alien context. Australia is largely seen as a success story when it comes to multiculturalism, but it's less clear whether there is genuine intercultural engagement between people from different backgrounds. Right. So is it enough to just coexist peacefully and not want to right. kill the other person, right? Or is, is asking for more than that a bit too ambitious? I don't think it is. It, it's not ambitious in principle. I mean, again, let me give you a story example. Um, a few years back, there was a family joined my church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is a um, historically a, a, a white Dutch immigrant community, but uh, obviously is, is more diverse today. A uh, family joined our church who were from Burundi, uh, had spent 28 years in refugee camps in, uh, in Tanzania and had finally uh, been resettled to the, uh, to the United States. And they arrived with no English, a um, little bit of French, Kirundi, no literacy in any language, six months of government refugee resettlement money um, and the mandate to go find a job and six children. And so I and a few others became involved with them trying to help them to learn to live in American society, which when you start helping someone else to do that turns out to be a very complex task. And um, I remember one day I'd, I'd taken some of the kids out to Lake Michigan and uh, we were driving back to Grand Rapids and they told me their parents were not at home and, and we had to go somewhere else. So we went and navigated Grand Rapids and, and uh, arrived in this very white, middle-class Dutch looking suburb. And they said, come see, come see. And, uh, and I could start to hear this music. Can I get out of the car and go around the back of the house? There's a big fence around the backyard. And I opened the door in the fence, and I swear that if I had taken a photograph forwards through that gap in the fence, I could have persuaded all my friends I'd gone to Burundi for my vacation. There was an African wedding in full progress with, a, with an animal on a spit, with, a, with people with drums and people in African costume and dancing and so on. And, and behind me is white suburban Grand Rapids, and in front of me is Burundi. And I remember just thinking, it became a vivid picture for me of just how we can actually live in complete ignorance of what's around us, because most people I know would have no idea that, that there is Africa in this suburb, right? And, uh, and yet, for me, it's been just tremendously enriching getting to know that family and getting to know their networks and also standing, understanding a little bit of the struggles that they're having, you know, interacting with, with North American social services and, uh, and employment systems and, and so on. And, um, yeah, is it unrealistic to expect that I might make one or two of those relationships? I don't think so. You know, there's, there's most people have enough time in their life to get to know at least one extra person. And I found just spending time with, uh, with, with the, the Bamboniehu family has, uh, has just taught me a lot of things about my own town. I mean, just, you know, where you go to buy goat meat and, <laughs> and so on. Um, and about my own privilege within that, within that city and, uh, and about the things that are important to them, the things that cause them suffering, the things that cause them difficulty navigating. And, and I would never have learned any of that stuff if I'd stayed secure in my own, in my own little circle and my favourite store and my favourite pub and so on, where, where I've... I'm living in this imagined city that doesn't actually map onto the real one that I'm living in. So, so I guess another way of putting this is how, how in touch with reality do I want to be in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of where I live and what's going on around me. But it takes a posture of humility, right? And, and it can be as risky as it is rewarding. It does, yeah. I've got to start from the assumption that I'm not God's final model for human beings on planet Earth. To set aside a certain amount of privilege, to not come in on the assumption that I'm better. I was touched with the African family I know where once I was with them and some of their, their relatives were visiting. They'd, they'd been sent to various American cities as a group of refugees. And uh, one of them just, just took me aside afterwards and told me it was the first time he'd seen someone interact with his, um, with his aunt, who was the mother of the family, sort of like a human being. And I wasn't doing anything particularly special. I was just listening and talking and acting like I was talking to equals. But so often, when we cross differences, we act like we're talking down, um, or that we're talking to someone strange, or 
just take enough humility to kind of lay that down and say, you know what, there are other inter interesting ways of being human and maybe God has something to teach me through those too. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Dave. You're welcome. That's Professor David Smith from Calvin College talking about living with the other and what it means to love them as well. If you'd like to learn more, have a look at his book, Learning from the Stranger, Christian Faith and Cultural Diversity. Catch you next time on Life and Faith. Thank you.